last few weeks to make our uh, our backdrop available. Uh, little hands may go for a little more. Uh, even in the weeks to come, uh, now that you know about it, you can, uh, at no charge, take some pictures out in the lobby at the little display that's out there that was really put up for that one of the, one of those reasons as well. Um, all this month we'll be observing the the Lighty Moon Christmas offering. There is a special envelope for that, uh, and they're they're in the back and some are out in the lobby as well. So rather than just give reflexively, pray and and ask the Lord uh, how how you might certainly pray, but uh, financially give to keep our IMB missionaries on the field. We were grateful for your support for almost nine years in Brazil, so we know the difference that uh, uh, that our cooperative uh, giving makes. So pray. God will give you a figure, I promise, and uh, the envelopes are in the back. There's some more of these shoebox little trifolds. Uh, there are some in the back. I want to encourage you to grab one, not to give because that time is gone, but to pray over the, the countries who will be receiving these boxes. And so grab this as a reminder to put in your Bible to pray for certain people groups or for those that will receive the gift that contains the glorious gospel and those that will share it. So there's some of those. Let's don't let them go to waste. We don't want to throw any of those, those away. Also, we have an opportunity for the, to, to give to uh, our benevolence. It's a large and broad ministry. It's not a program, but it's a ministry. On the tree outside, it just says the giving tree. Pray and ask God how much you'll share with our community and with others as we approach the Christmas season and the giving season. So um, there will be plenty of envelopes. Uh, last year was an enormous blessing, and so this year pray and uh, just put that in the envelope. Uh, just like that, if you put cash in there, you may want to write your name on the back or something. Uh, but you can give all throughout December there. We also will have about uh, 15 or so food boxes. There's some men in our community who have put these together. And in putting them together, they've been, some have been made available to us. And so these aren't just for, for like just random God will bring somebody to you, and you'll know. I've already had three or four calls from people. It says, I know someone who could use a, a food b a box for, for Christmas. So we're making that list. You can call Janelle or call me. But be, be watchful uh, as God's at work to see who and how we might be a blessing to them. And that's just the start. Giving them a food box is just the start. We go well beyond that. Lastly, um, Clarence lost his nephew, Kent, this past weekend, uh, just eating at a restaurant. He just passed very, very suddenly. Also a relative of uh, Shan and Ann uh, Teague. Uh, and then Ernie lost his mom just yesterday. Uh, she had been battling with cancer. And so there's a, a lot of needs within the body and within our community. So if there's others that I'm unaware of, please, uh, please let me know. It's my joy to get to open us uh, this morning. It's not going to be on the screen, so Steve didn't mess up by not putting it there. It comes from Colossians chapter 1. Begin reading in verse 15. We just went through the book of Colossians, so some of you will uh, be easily recognize this. This is the word of the Lord. He, that's Christ, He's the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, things that are visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence, he may have superiority. And then uh, verse 9 of chapter 2. For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.
Father, we've come here to this place and even before a screen intentionally with purpose to not just hear a sermon, to not only sing songs, but to worship you, to give you the glory and the awe and the praise and the worship that you alone deserve. And so we thank you that, that we can ask you to prepare our hearts for worship, that you would prepare our minds to affirm and to receive the great truths that we will sing and that we will see in your scriptures. Lord, we are a needy people. We, we need to pray. We need the, your power that we access when we pray. There is no greater power. So Lord, for those who are hurting due to loss during these days and this season, we pray your great comfort. Not something that you send from afar, but something that comes close and personal to us. So comfort with your presence, O oh God, we pray. For those who are fearful, they're fearful of the unknown, they're fearful of the future, Lord, we pray that you would calm their fears by allowing them to just catch a glimpse of you and who you are. And that they would see your greatness and glory transcends, overwhelms anything that our eyes might see to cause us to fear. Lord, for those that, that have needs that are hidden, they're not secret because nothing's a secret from you. We pray, O oh God, that you would draw them out. That as a body of Christ, we might be channels of your comfort and hope to them. Lord, we thank you and we bless you for how you're at work within this body and within our church. As we seek to worship and serve you throughout this holiday season and beyond. So all glory and all praise and all honor and all worship goes to you, O oh God, our head. From hearts full of faith and thanksgiving, we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. As we prepare our hearts uh, for the reading of the word and prayer, let's stand. This song is very appropriate for this, uh, this time of the year. It just sums up the gospel, the redemption narrative of what Christ, his mission, how he accomplished that mission, and ultimately what that means for us. So let's proclaim that this morning. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of Go. 
I noticed he didn't hug everyone. Okay, let me get this situated here. I'm really excited um, about the message, but at the same time I'm humbled. I'm always grateful for those who come live and, and those who are on Facebook Live to come and, and be a part of our worship. Um, but I'll tell you from the outset, this message is... It's challenging because we're going to think in realms and in ways that we just don't typically think. And so we're going to hear things and think, okay, is it true and, and do I believe that? Um, and and how, is it going to, how is it going to plumb some depths that may not have been plumbed in a while for you? For those of us who know the scriptures, especially the gospels, we see time and time again the religious teachers and the, and the officials ask this question, who is this man? 
They followed him, they watched him, they encountered him, and they time and time again asked this question, who is this man? And for the religious, it was primarily, who is this man that forgives sin? I mean, that's, that's you know, they, they felt challenged and offended. Tax collectors, the marginalized, the, 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 the worst of sinners, they asked themselves, who is this man? And some scriptures may be coming to mind as we're familiar with the Gospels. Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee, uh, who was appointed to be over Galilee, said this. He says, I know who John the Baptist is. I know who he is because I personally had him beheaded. But who is this man over here referring to, to Christ? It's all throughout the Gospels. The disciples were on the Sea of Galilee, and they felt like they were perishing. They were going to die. Master, do you see us over here? And so after he calmed the seas by just speaking to it, what was there? Who is this man that the winds and the seas obey? They're not a, this is not a rhetorical question. Even those who knew Jesus the best are recorded as asking through the Scriptures, Who is this man? He was no ordinary man. He was was certainly extraordinary. He was perplexing. He did things that no man should be able to do, but yet people were watching him do it effortlessly. 5,000 knee deep, just got a few loaves and fish. It's perplexing. He He was confrontational with people he should not have been confrontational with. Don't upset those teachers and those scribes. Don't upset the government. Don't say these things. He was supernatural. He was extraordinary. Things that he did were extraordinary. And people responded to that. But he was a man. So let's answer this question. Let's address this this mystery as we're going to look at over the next three weeks. It wasn't until about the 1500s that theologians began to ask this question. Or you'd think it would have come much sooner, but it didn't. And here it is. Can the finite contain the infinite? Now, those of us who aren't Dr. Horner or Shan or uh, some calculus you know, guru, think about that. There's the question. Can, can something that's finite, like us, can we contain something that's infinite? Let me ask it. And in Latin, which this was first thought about, these two things mean the same thing and they're in the same sentence. Can the finite even grasp infinity? Not can we contain it, can we even grasp it? Well, those are, that's part of this mystery, this wondrous mystery. And so we're going to consider that this morning. So we're going to look at, at truths, truths that are simply that just that just lift off the pages of Scripture. And so we're going to start with the context of this message by looking at the eternity that existed before Christmas. There was something that existed before Christmas. John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. It says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Originally, in the original text, was is, I mean, the is not there. He was the beginning with God, is, is, what's, is what's portrayed there. So there was this eternity long before Christmas. But we don't think in those terms very often. See, as human beings, we have conception, and then we have birth, and that marks our what? Our origin. There's conception, there's birth, it marks our origin. Prior to conception, what was our status? Don't be foolish, Bill. Before you were ever conceived, what was your status? That's exactly right, non-existent. Now, here's the glory, part of the mystery. Not so with God. It's not so with God, the Son of God. Christmas is not the beginning of Christmas. Christmas is, I mean... Christmas is not the beginning of Christ. He's, it's not the beginning of Christ. Long before the Christmas story, and even the prophecies in the, um, in the Old Testament, 
Christ was and Christ always has been in eternity past. Now, you may want to get some note paper. You may want to make some notes. There's going to be a lot of scripture because that's where the authority is. That's where the truth is. So we're going to look at maybe 20, 25 scriptures this morning, moving through them pretty, pretty rapidly. So if you need to get up and get a piece of paper, I, I want to encourage you to do so. So we're going to start with Micah 5.2. But you, Bethlehem. Bethlehem, really? Back in my, yeah, Bethlehem, little bitty town, five miles outside of Jerusalem. Though, though you're a little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from where? Are from, are from old and from everlasting. They didn't know how to say eternity past, but this is about as close as they can come front to it. So there was this eternity that existed long before Christmas. David Mathis is a pastor up in uh, Minnesota, and he says this, Christmas wasn't the start, but the commission of Christ. He, he was not created, he came. Now, when I wrote that down before in my notes, before I put it in the sermon, I, I kept just coming back to that again and again and again. And it just kept growing in its dimension. Christ, Christ, he, he was not created, but he came. Oh, is this a joke? Is this kind of a word picture? Is this a magic trick that somebody that wasn't created came? No, no. You know, I've been challenged over the, the, the last several weeks. More distinct than his virgin birth, more distinct is his preexistence. Is that in that eternity past, he, he is. Not he was, he is. And see, we have, and mine have been challenged this week as well, we have shallow expectations. We wander around in just not even ankle deep water sometimes. And, and we just go back to Luke 1 and 2 and say, well, this is it. This is where he came. This, and so the limit of our theology sometimes is just Luke 1 and 2. Forgetting that, that this, the, there was an eternity before Christmas. But that's where it kind of all seems to start for us. So we're going to look at several factors. First, Christ existed before his incarnation. Before he came in the flesh, he existed. Okay, uh, true. Let's move on. No, let's look at some scripture. John 8, 58. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. That's Jesus' own words. He makes this stunning and really unexpected claim. That before Abraham was, I am. And it was so offensive when he said this. Anybody quickly recall what happened after he said this? That's right. The Jews picked up stones and said, we're going to kill you for saying that. It's absurd that you would say that. How can you even think that, much less say that? And so he says, before Abraham was, the Jews wanted to kill him. He existed before his incarnation. And, and certainly the Jews didn't want to hear that. And so we're going to look at the mystery of, of several aspects. Um, first is the mystery of his coming. See, it's hard, and, it, and you don't have to stand up here and say this kind of stuff. Jesus came. Oh, yeah, well, he came at Bethlehem there at the stable. No, no, Jesus, he, he came. Mark 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send a messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight, make his path straight. This, the, just simplicity, but yet the beauty of this, of this scripture. He himself makes... Um, he himself makes several claims that, that aren't claims, they're just simple truths that people struggle to embrace. And sometimes we even do as well. Christ came from where? 
Yeah, from, let's say from outside the created realm. He didn't come from any place that was created. He came from outside of that. And, in, and His coming into our world to rescue it, He did so, as it says in Mark 10 and Luke 9, giving His life as a ransom for many. And to, to seek and to save the lost. He came from outside to do that. Clearly in 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying. It's worthy of all acceptance. It's a pretty good lead in. That Christ came into the world. He came into the world. He came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says of whom I am the chief. Grasp it. He who has always been. Came. Now we shouldn't say well big deal. We shouldn't just say, okay. We think, why? Why, why was this necessary? And, and, and you're kind of belaboring this, and we're going to belabor it some more. Can we, can, can we see that there's a greater depth? Can we get out of the ankle-deep water and begin to consider Christ existed before his incarnation? He came. He came. It's clear from Scripture. Not only that, there's this mystery of his becoming. And, and without Mathis uh, in a book that he had written, I would have just glossed over this. 2 Corinthians 8 9. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is the goodness, the weightiness, the heaviness of God. That though he was rich, how was, how was, he, how was he rich? He was divinely rich. Everything that was the Father's was the Son. He was divinely rich. All right? So he was divinely rich. Yet for your sakes, he became poor. How poor was he? He was humanly poor. Do we see the contrast? Divinely rich, humanly poor, he came. And then he became. He became. Glory to God. For your sakes, that through his poverty, you might become rich. Wow, this mystery of his, his becoming. Philippians 2. He came in the form of God. He was being in the form of God. He didn't consider it robbery to be <clears throat> equal with God. But not only that, he, he took on the form of a servant, of a bondservant, and he came in the likeness of men. Do you see this divine richness and this human uh, poverty? This, this, he was humanly poor. Hebrews 2.9, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the what? A little lower than the angels. For the suffering of the death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. He would taste death for you. He became. Do you see? It's not just the chosen. He became. There was that transformation. Now, we'll broaden out and it won't be quite as, 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 as hard to think in some of these terms. But, but, but we got to close out this portion about his existence before his incarnation. And we have to see and we have to ask ourselves. Well, what was he before he came? Well, he was God. Okay, but what was he before he came? You may have to come back and, and listen to this message three or four times. I know I'll listen to it a couple of times to, to re-preach it to myself. The fully divine Son never at any point ceased existing and being what He was before. You get that? It wasn't like, okay, He downshifted. It, you know, he, he traded in. He was a lesser model. The fully divine Son never ceased being what He had been previous to His coming. He was still that. And here's what He... He added full humanity. He added to what He was preexistently to His, his person becoming and coming as man. Now, that sounds pretty simple until you begin to process it with your, your theology. He came. He became. He was given. He was 
given. Now here's saying that Christ was given. This ought to be the easiest one for you for you to take and say, well, okay, I think I've, without thinking too deeply on that, I think I've, why? Because we all know John three sixteen, right? God so loved the world that he what he gave his only begotten Son. He gave. So so this preexistent one came, became, and was given. Look at Romans eight thirty two. I think it says it as well. So he didn't spare his own son. But delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely, what? Give us all things. Given. What was given preexisted before even the incarnation? Wow. Wow. So next we see that Christ existed. He was preexistent, right? He was before anything was. But he also existed before creation. At first, I thought I would just leave this out, but the, the more I read and studied, the more it really needed to be uh, part, part of the, the message. Before creation, he existed. Before the first Christmas, he existed. Before the first Christmas ever, he existed. But he also existed before any of creation. We looked at John 1 through 3. We'll look at it again. In the beginning, in the very beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through Him and without Him nothing was made that was made. Nothing was made that was made. We saw from Colossians. By Him and for Him and to Him. Look at John 1.14. The Word became flesh. And the Word became flesh and it what? And it dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. Christ existed before creation. But yet He came in the flesh and we beheld His glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father. And He was full of grace and truth. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. I read that, but let you look at the, the words. For by Him all things were created. And it doesn't stop there. Created where? In heaven. And where else? On earth, visible and invisible. You know, thanks to God and His glory and His grace, there's been things that were invisible for thousands of years that suddenly are visible, like DNA. You know, when we get micro, macro and we look out into the, the heavens, we see the handiwork and, and the fact that there is, there is a God to order that. And then we come into the micro and we see things that are in, in, in that that we can't see by eye, and we find even there we see the handiwork and the signature of God. It's in the visible and in the invisible. It's in the heavens on earth, dominions and principalities and powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. All things. So He's before all things, and in Him all things consist. So let's just see what Jesus says in the high priestly prayer in John 17 about himself. He says, now, Father, John 17, 5, glorify me together with yourself. The glory which I had with you before the world was. It's his own, his own, own declaration, his own testimony, his own words. So he existed before anything. He, he, he existed certainly before creation. But this pre-existent Son of God is fully human. Now for some of you, you'll grab this and it'll just be no problem. For others, like, wait a minute, I don't think in these terms. I don't think like this. I don't process Scripture like this. This is going to be a challenge for maybe some of you. During Jesus' life on earth in the Gospels, we don't see anyone in the Gospels really question His humanity. Right, well, there's that man, there's Jesus. You see, why, why did they not question his humanity? Because they saw him, and they talked with him, and they heard him, and they ate with him, and they drank with him, and they watched him cry. They watched him spit on the ground and make spittle and put it on somebody's eye. They watched him get spat upon. There was no problem with anyone recognizing that he was fully human. The question surrounding him as he shared life with them 
And that was the reason that it was no problem believing in his humanity. It was because he, he did share life in every phase with them. But the key was this. Is there, is there some way, somehow, that this man might be more than human? I mean, look at the things he does. C- could he actually be God in the flesh among us? Among, among us. <clears throat> I had to verify this two or three times two or three sources, not long after Jesus' resurrection and his ascension into heaven, Jesus' divinity first became a given. And then they began to question his humanity. Isn't that backwards? When he was here and everybody was sharing life with him, they, they knew he was man, but this can't be God. And then he's resurrected and they start to worship him. And they said, yeah, he was certainly God, but I don't know if he was human or not. And so then we, they, they, that, that had to be addressed, right? Like, well, you just got to have more faith. That wasn't it. Look at 1 John. By this you'll know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Did that really need to be said? Yeah, it did. And it said more than once. Because we, oh, no way. He was, no, there's no way it, that, that the finite can hold the infinite. Or that the infinite can even comprehend the infinite. That the finite can even comprehend the infinite. Oh my. Second John 7, he says the same thing. For many deceivers have gone out from, into the world who do not confess. What don't they confess? Jesus says, coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist that doesn't think that, doesn't say that, doesn't declare that. Wow. He was fully human. You see... This Advent season, and then on Wednesday I did a, a little short video about what really is Advent. I encourage you to, to see that. But it can be really challenging for us today because we, here's what we do. We pick and choose aspects of the Advent season that are comfortable to us, that we like, that, that promote things well, you know, that, that tend to make us feel better, and we gloss completely over the things that, that make us uncomfortable and that are challenging to us. I didn't expect any amens, but that's, that's, that's the way we've come to, to sugarcoat this Advent season. The Son of God came. And he, 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 he came fully in a human body. He, he had a, a fully human mind. He had a, a fully human heart. And he had a fully human will. What am I saying? It was, it was just like yours and mine. Body, mind, heart, and will. And let me, let me go ahead and encourage you and remind you, he still does. He still does. But see, we don't, we don't think like that when we think about it. So let's look at this human body. I don't want to convince, but let's look and see what the scripture says. It makes it clear. Jesus has, has a human body. John 1.14 the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And, and we beheld His glory. It wasn't, well, I think I saw it. Well, I think I saw what I saw. Well, somebody said they saw what I saw. He was born. Jesus grew. He was tired. He was thirsty. He was hungry. He wept. He died. He had a real human body, though now it's glorified since the resurrection. His human body. We could look at many, many other texts. Secondly, his human emotions. We'll go through these very quickly. Matthew 8.10, he marveled. He marveled. He demonstrated emotions. Matthew 26.38, he was sorrowful. He was sorrowful. John 11.33, he was greatly troubled. Emotions. He wept over Jerusalem. And if we had had time, we had looked at countless scriptures where he was full of joy or he was rejoicing or he was celebrating and celebratory. Jesus has human emotions, but also he had a human mind. Luke 2.52. He increased in wisdom 
and in stature and in favor with God and men. He increased. Jesus knows all things as God. And here's one we struggle yet. Yet he does not know all things as man. You think, well, okay, now you're gonna, now you kind of lost me. There's one person, there's two natures. That's not contradictory, that's complementary. Who said that he didn't know when he's coming again? Jesus himself said that. He said only the Father knows that. His human will. He had a human will just like we do. And this may be the greatest attribute to, uh, for us to really process. Jesus had a divine will. But he also had a human will. And they both existed with perfect balance. Look at John 6.38. For I have not come down from heaven not to do my own will, he says. Meaning I have one and I'm not going to do it. But what did he come for? He came in order to do the will of him who sent me. He came to do the will of the Father. So we see there are these two that exist. Matthew 26, 38 or 39. He went a little farther and fell on his face and he prayed and he said to the Father, he said what? If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And he says, nevertheless, not as I will, not my will, but as you will. Your will be done. And so we see that he has an infinite, an infinite divine will that is what? That is the will of the Father. It's in perfect agreement with the Father. But at the same time, as a man, he's got this finite human will. And it's perfectly in sync and submissive to the divine will of the Father. We see it's complementary. So he's fully God and he's fully man. And he's certainly worthy of our, of our worship, wonder, and praise. So let's land the plane. We can now see that there are a, a lot of wondrous mysteries that have kind of upset our little boat here at the Advent and Christmas. Because like I said, we like to, you know, the, the, the pleasing, the non-challenging things we like to incorporate at Advent. And those that may be a little bit deeper or more, more problematic to our own theology we tend to set aside. But we've looked at parts of this great mystery that we, that we can behold because we have the scriptures, the teaching of the Holy Spirit. So let's kind of draw this together and, and land the plane. Jesus is like us in every aspect. He is like us in every aspect. Heart, mind, body, and will, except for sin. Except for sin. You want to really challenge somebody, just ask them, what do you think Jesus is doing right now? Um, uh, well, what do you think Jesus is doing right now? I mean, he's doing something. He's, what does the scripture say? So, well, uh, you know, really challenge people. Secondly, Jesus didn't just take on, take on a part of our humanity, but he took all of it. He didn't come and say, this is good, I'll keep this, that's a no, yes, no, yes, no. He came and he took on all of it. And then he just didn't come and walk a few steps in our shoes. He, he took the path all the way to the cross for us. These, these are the truths. Yeah, glorious amen. So we see, how do people respond to this man? Who is this man? The wise, the wise men, what? They brought gifts. Gifts for a what? For a king. Mary gives us her Magnificat. We, we see her in her glorious song. Her offering and contribution. What, what was in her heart and spirit. The shepherds. They, they, they leave the light show. The greatest light show. And sounds were ever displayed in the heavens. To go give him glory. They didn't have much to give. But what they did give. They gave him his worship and glory. What about you? What about you? What will cause this Advent season between now and, and what we mark as, as Christmas, 
what needs to happen in order to, to deepen the shallow expectations as you begin to plumb some of the great mysteries, great mysteries of His preexistence, of His coming, and glory to God, His coming again. He is coming again. God Himself left the glories of heaven and eternity past to become one of us. And so who is this man? Who is this man? It's, it's a good question. But the better question is this. Who do you say he is? That's the question that matters most. Who do you say he is? Let's pray. Lord, as we've looked at a lot of scripture, it's a lot to process. It's not, a, it's not about a, a lot to even think about. It's, about. it's about truth. Truth is a person, and that person is Jesus. And, and so we've been reminded this morning of the greatness and the glory of and the grandeur, the grandeur of thinking about the Christ in ways we simply don't think today. And so you know how you want to use this message in each of our hearts individually. You know where you want to deepen our wonder. You know where you want to, you want to resolve some of the mysteries that we've held. That, that poor theology keeps us from living and believing and doing by faith what you called us to do. So open our eyes. Open our hearts, Lord. May we humbly yet let sincerely ask you, what part of this message was meant for me? Where are you telling me, like you told Peter, cast on out a little bit farther and, and, and throw your nets into the deep? He's there waiting. So, Father, we thank you, and we love you, that our faith is anchored to these great truths, that by way of your spirit and your word, our reality to us, give us hope among the hopeless. All glory to you, O Christ our head, we pray in Jesus' name. As we stand and sing in worship in response to the reading of the word. This is the first step in that ark in what Christ has done for us. So let's sing to the glory of his coming. Oh
unfamiliar, just uh, let the words and the message uh, resonate. Uh, it's based off the Apostles' Creed, which is just affirming these things that Christ has taught us. darkness. 
Benediction comes from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a blessed Lord's Day. Mm-hmm.